Los Angeles, California. Would y'all just welcome all of those watching us now? Hallelujah. Thank y'all so much. Wonderful job. Are y'all ready to get into the word today? We are going to finish our series today, Soul Surgery. Would you stand on your feet with me? Hallelujah. Would you stand on your feet with me and just lift your Bibles high? And we're going to make our confession of faith together. We are going to complete our series today, Soul Surgery. Now look at your neighbor and say, this has been good for you. Now, even if you're, this is your first time with us and maybe you've not been here for this series, we're just going to call things to be not as though they were. So this has been good for you. <laughs> and this is going to be real good for you. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, today we're going to destroy your excuses. Look, look, look at me, y'all. Look at me, look at me, look at me. We, we got a lot of good excuses and a lot of good reasons about why we're not doing this and that and this and that and this and that. And you know, and they're comforting. Our excuses are comforting. It feels good to have an excuse, doesn't it? When you're running late, you're, ooh, I was in traffic. Well, you knew it was going to be traffic because you knew you had to drive on the highways, didn't it? But doesn't the excuse feel good? Come on, just be honest. It feels good. It feels good. You know, it's comforting. You know why? Because our default as human beings is to be like Adam. And while Adam was made in the image and likeness of God, he was God's son, superior to the angels, because the angels were servants. They could never be sons. Adam was God's son. He was God's likeness in the earth. Psalm called him a little lower than Elohim himself. And when God said, I want you to be me in the earth, you know what he came up with? An excuse. So that's our default. But today, somebody shout today. Yeah. Now, now, this is only for those of you that say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired about the same stuff. And it's not that everything is bad. It's just there's certain stuff that I'm sick of being sick and tired about. Well, where y'all at? Is it? Okay. All right. All right. So, so this word is going to bust those excuses up for you today. Can we bust it up today? Yeah. Hallelujah. Stand with me. Lift your Bibles out. Let's make our confession of faith together. This is my Bible. It is the living word of God. It gives me abundant life. I'm not just a hearer of the word. I'm a doer of the word. This word teaches me that I am more than a Hallelujah. Remain standing. I want you to flip to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And if you are uh, a VIP for us today, just what we call our first time guest, you're very important to us. Hallelujah. Uh, if you are a, a first time guest today, uh, as we get into this series, I encourage you to get the previous messages from this series. Or maybe if you've just not been here, you've been off for a few weeks or something, I don't know. Just I encourage you to get the rest of the messages in this series. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. You got it? You <laughs> You got it? Amen. Where y'all at? Oh, is it my pink pants that's got you? Yeah, is that what you, that's why you can't talk? It's supposed to be springtime, so I'm dressing for what it's supposed to be. Now, don't you start nothing with me just because you couldn't pull it off. Don't you, don't you act like that with me. Oh, I'm doing the doggone thing. I, I, I don't know. All right, I'll just. I'm just joking, relax. Is that what it is? God wanted. It. Ain't nobody saying that, but y'all looking, but ain't saying nothing. Oh. Because ain't nobody got time for nine degree weather. I ain't got time for that. How you gonna go from 60 uh, day before yesterday and talk about nine this month? That ain't gonna work for me. So I'm gonna dress for what I want, not what I got. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter one. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Y'all got it? Okay, that'll work. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to his spiritual son, Timothy, whose name uh, entails honor. He says this. He says, for God has not given us a spirit or mindset of fear. Okay. Which means if, if you're scared, that's not God. He said, God didn't give us a spirit or a mindset of fear, but he gave us what? Power, which there is the Greek dunamis, which means it's miracle working power. It means it's a miracle within itself that you have the power. In other words, please understand, the way you made it through all the hell that you've been through is because God gave you some dunamis. 
And the reason you're not sitting at home depressed today is because God gave you some power. Anybody in here got power? Uh -huh, yeah, that's how I made it through all of what hell. And that's how I made it through every storm. And that's how I made it through every problem is because I had some power. Touch your neighbor and say, I got the power. But God has not given us a spirit or a mindset of fear, but he gave us some power. And he gave us some love. And he gave us a mind that can act right. Sound mind. Now lay your hands on yourself. We're going to get into this today. But I told you we're going to destroy your excuses today. Lay your hands on yourself and say, in the name of Jesus, I remove fear. It has no right to be in me any further since God didn't give it to me. Father, I decrease that you might increase. Speak to us now with clarity that we might move in those things that we, you have ordained for us. We honor you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, normally I would have you high five your neighbor and, and encourage them with something, but I, I want to teach you the word you're going to encourage them with first. Say, atelophobia. 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 Now say it quickly. Atelophobia. Just your neighbor say, today, today. Be, set be set free from atelophobia. You can be seated in the presence of God. In this series, we've been talking about, of course, soul surgery. Your soul, you are a spirit that has a physical body uh, that also has a soul. You're a spirit that lives in a physical body that has a soul. Your soul is your mind, your thoughts, your will, and your emotions. And we've discussed in this series that often people and situations are gone, but we're left to clean up the baggage that they leave, and it becomes lodged in our soul. Now, that word you just said to your neighbor, a telephobia, is this. It is a fear of not feeling good enough. I said it is a fear of not feeling good enough. And if we're all honest with ourselves, uh, the truth of the matter is, is that while we may be able to fake our neighbor out, and while we may be able to fake our friends out, the reality is, is that we often battle with a telephobia. We often battle with the fear of not feeling like we're good enough, and it comes out in how we live our lives. Now, check this out. Uh, a telephobia, you see the suffix there, phobia, means fear. Say fear. Now, the scripture just told us that God did not give us a spirit or a mindset of fear, which means that if I start fearing something and I start thinking that I'm not good enough or feeling that I'm not good enough, that means it had to come from a source of God. I said it had to come from a source other than God, which means it comes from one of three places. It means, watch this, it comes, number one, because someone said you weren't. Uh, please understand, how much do you fear because of what somebody else has said to you or said about you? You can't do this. You're going to be just like so-and-so. You ain't never do nothing. Yeah, nothing you do is right. Nothing you touch is right. This and that, this and that. And so now all of a sudden, when you try to move forward in your life, you've got the voices of other people playing in your mind like a DVD player that's stuck on the menu. And so every moment you try to move forward, you've got this thing playing in your mind because somebody said you weren't good enough. Anybody ever been told you weren't good enough? Come on, let's just be honest. Any, anybody ever been told you're not going to succeed at this? This isn't your thing. You ain't going to make it. No, no, no. Our family doesn't do that kind of stuff. Our bloodline doesn't do that kind of stuff. We don't go those kind of places. Everybody we know is like this because somebody said it doesn't mean it has to be true for me. See, your jacked up reality doesn't get to affect my reality, which means just because you don't feel good enough, don't mean you got to pull me down to where you're at. I've discovered that many people, especially people who profess to be Christians, the way they feel spiritual is by having a superiority complex. And so they think that the only way they can feel spiritual is by bringing everybody else down. You didn't hear what I said. Do you love Jesus because you love him or do you love him because you get to judge other people who don't live the way you quite live? Okay, y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. Oftentimes, the way people make themselves feel better is they have to bring others down. See, that's what Facebook comments are all about. Oh, Y'all don't know nothing about Facebook comments here? That's what YouTube comments are about. It's to give losers a way to bring other people down. So you can, you can develop. I, I can see we're going to have to work hard here. All right. How to work a job. How to work a job. Here we go. So, so watch this now. First thing, watch this. You can develop a fear of not feeling good enough because somebody said you weren't. But then secondly, you can develop that fear because a past experience said you weren't. You ever tried to do something you thought you'd be able to do and then truth be told, it didn't quite work out the way you wanted it to work out? <laughs> Four of us, okay? <laughs> 
I'm going to ask one more time. You, 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 ever, you ever went to do something and you just knew, oh, I got this. It's going to be a piece of cake, a piece of pound cake with extra butter and a little lemon spread off the top. You better get your eating in. You got a few more hours. You better get it in. <laughs> we, some of y'all saying, what is he talking about? We're getting ready to start a corporate 21-day fast. And so, Bishop, I thought you weren't supposed to talk about it. It's corporate, so <laughs> that's why we talk about it, because it's corporate. I can't keep it a secret, and then you expect you to know that you're supposed to be on the fast. A past experience can tell you that you're not. Watch this. If, if you've ever had a relationship that you really, really wanted to work and it failed, then now you can have the expectation that every relationship is going to fail. Because you feel like, I'm just not good enough. If you ever tried to start a business and your business failed, you'll feel like, ah, I'm just not good enough. I'm not cut out for this. So somebody can tell you you're not good enough, but then an experience can tell you you're not good enough. And you perceive that your failure had something to do with your value. You perceive that your failure had something to do with your value. And the issue with that is, is that, please understand, a Rolls Royce, even if it breaks down, is still a Rolls Royce. Even a broke down one's going to cost you more than a new something else. And that's why the scripture says, Revelation 1, 6, and he has made us to be both kings and priests. Which means, please understand, even when I mess up, even when I fail, even when it doesn't go the way I want it to, that didn't change my value. My circumstance does not dictate to me my value. But oftentimes, we can allow them to. And then third, watch this, here's the one that's going to psych your mind. You can develop a fear of not feeling good enough because you said you weren't. We often can develop a, a, a complex that makes us disqualify ourselves from stuff. Let me prove it to you. Have you ever said this to yourself, what's wrong with me? It's quiet in this church. I mean, you'd think, <laughs> let me talk to this side. Maybe they'll talk to me. You, you, you ever said to yourself, I don't know why I just can't do anything right. And it's amazing because listen to the words you use. I don't know why I can't do anything right. You have now, because of one thing, disqualified everything. I, I just, uh, I just, I guess I'm just always going to be like this. Always. You, you're letting a temporary location make you make a permanent confession. I don't know why. What's wrong with me? Why, why this? Why that? Why that? So you can develop, because remember, God didn't give us a telephobia, which means somebody said we weren't good enough, an experience said we weren't good enough, or we said to ourselves we weren't good enough. And can I tell you something about a telephobia? A telephobia normally shows up when you're doing something you've never done before. See, please understand, it, uh, things only seem challenging when they're new. Okay, let me, what are you trying to say? When you're doing the same old stuff that you've always done, you don't feel challenged because you're comfortable in what you've always done. That's why you've been doing it, because you're comfortable doing it, because you've always done it. But a telephobia shows up when you're trying to do something that you, you've never done before. It, it doesn't show up when you're doing what you've always done. When it shows up, check it out, it brings every insecurity to the surface. Because you're doing something you've never done before, so it's a challenge. And so, because it's a challenge now, every insecurity that you have ever thought about, every insecurity that you've ever had now comes to the surface. And can I tell you that the Bible is full of people with insecurities that had never done things before. They had to press past a telephobia. This Bible is not a book of perfect people. This Bible is a book full of people that said, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And the truth is, I might feel scared about how I'm going to get it done. But I know that I serve a God that with him all things are possible. And I, I know in myself I can't figure it out. But that's why he gave me grace. And that's why he gave me mercy. And that's why he gave me his goodness. Because I'm scared, but he's not. I got insecurities. He doesn't. What is it? Why, why is it? What, can, can I give you some examples? Can I give you some examples? Because see, the Bible is full of, full of people who had done things that they had never, ever done before. 
Think about it. Abraham. Abraham, Genesis 12. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you and, all, and you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. He said, uh, I want you to go to a land I'm going to show you. Lord, where's the land? I'll tell you when we get there. Now, he had never seen anybody in his bloodline do that before. His father was a, the Bible, his name literally means he was a wild goat. <clears throat> he was a loiterer is what that name means. He was, a, you know what loiterers do? They always talk about what they're going to do because they're never doing it. You ever met somebody like that? They talk about what they're going to do. And sometimes it's because sometimes people come to church, they say, I'm going to do this, 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 I'm going to do this. Then I never ever see him again. It's like, <laughs> loiterer. You talk a good talk, but your walk. Okay, it got real quiet right there. It's full of people that had never done things before. And the truth is, it was a challenge. And the truth is, is that they confronted this atelophobia the same way you and I do. Now, I want to ask a question before, before I give you some examples. Uh, anybody, uh, just from the little bit I've just shared, realize that this is something that's been in your face, this atelophobia. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, good. Every hand should be up. And if your hand isn't up, then you got another problem called lying. And so then <laughs> what we need to then do is get you fixed from that. <laughs> so... So you may not have a telephobia. You got a lie, a lie, a lie, a lot of. That's what you got, a lie, a lot of. Okay, that's Hebrew for lie. Okay, watch this. Check this out. Jacob was a cheater. Yet he became the father of the children of Israel. Peter had a temper, and guess what? He was disloyal. Yet Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. David had an affair and set another man up, but the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Noah had a drinking problem. Noah liked the fruit of the vine. Yet in him, the scripture says, from him and his sons, the entire earth was populated. Jonah was a runner. Every time things got tough, he ran. Every time things looked like it wasn't going to be easy, he ran. Yet the Lord used him. Paul was a murderer, yet he preached the gospel to the entire continent of Asia in two years and three months. Gideon was insecure, yet the angel of the Lord says to him, rise up, you mighty man of valor. Miriam was a gossip. Yet the Lord used her as a prophetess. Martha was a warrior, but the Lord used her. Thomas was a doubter, but the Lord used him. Sarah was impatient, but the Lord used him. Elijah got depressed, but the Lord used him. Moses couldn't, 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 couldn't get his words out, but the Lord used him. He was a stutterer. Zacchaeus was too short, but the Lord used him. Abraham was too old, but the Lord used him. Check this one out. Lazarus was dead, but the Lord used him. I, I just need to know if I got a church full of people that say, I know I got some issues, but the Lord can still get the glory out of my life. All these people were doing things in their bloodline that nobody else had done. So naturally, they would be a telephobic because they had no point of reference to move forward. See, fear by its nature can only come in an environment where there is a lack of information. Fear isn't always the absence of faith. Not always. Sometimes fear is the presence of the lack of information. You fear what you don't know and don't understand. You ever had to get up and do something you never did? And you were scared of it, right? Then you did it, right? Then the next time you're like, oh, I did that. See, that's why, that's why sometimes, sometimes some of you feel like, God, what, what, why, is, why does it seem like I finished this and then I got to go do this? And then it seems like I get past one thing and then now I got another thing. It's because God said, you're the no one's ever done that before person. You're the one in your bloodline that God says, just like those people I just named, you haven't seen anybody necessarily do it in your bloodline. So you're the one that's now got to be the pioneer, which means the people after you get to just walk in the footsteps you've created. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying because you're going to make it easy for those that are coming after you. So stop complaining about being a pioneer when you're a pioneer. Guess what? You got to go through the jungle and nobody else cut down the trees. When you're a pioneer, you got to go in places and you got to knock some stuff down that nobody else had come before you to knock it down. But touch your neighbor and say, you're the one. You're the one. Yes, you are. You're the one. You're called to be the no one in our bloodline has ever done that before person. 
That's who you're supposed to be. And that's why some things, it'll, that's why sometimes in life, it'll seem like maybe you got the short end of the deal. Anybody ever felt like that? Come on, be honest. Anybody ever felt like God? Now, and you're praying and you're worshiping, but you're thinking to yourself, for real? Nobody? And then you see other people and you're like, well, I know it wasn't that hard for them. And the truth is, is that if you could sit down and talk to them, they would tell you, oh, my God, you have no clue how hard it was. Check this out. All of those people, I'm certain, had to deal with the telephobia. Because our default nature is to fear what we don't know. And that lack of information gives fear a, a, the ability to sustain and to live in a place. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Now, now, check this out. I'm about through. I want to make this simple. Just not even say simple. 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 Watch this. Here's how we respond to a telephobia. Because here's what you've been praying for. Lord, just take it away. Anybody ever done that? Lord, just take this fear. <laughs> you used to have a song, Mississippi Mass. Lord, I send it back to you. <laughs> well, he didn't send it, so you can't send it back. A telephobia is not just going to go away. You're not going to wake up one morning and all of a sudden all your fears are gone. No, that's not the way it works. That's, that's not the way it works. Because fear by its nature is designed to be, it, it, look, think of it this way. Fear is designed to choke you. Now, now just look straight ahead because we don't want, we want to protect the innocent and the guilty. If you've ever seen someone being choked, Just look at me. <laughs> if you've ever seen someone being choked, you'll notice that they, the rest of their body, shaka that the rest of their body, I feel a spirit, that the rest of their body could move. Let's check it out. The individual's hands were only on the neck. Now, y'all are missing it. But from this one place, your entire body was paralyzed. You're not hearing what I'm saying. So when fear shows up, it comes at one place, but it's designed to stop all of you. You didn't hear what I just said. It's only coming at one access point, but from that one access point, it wants to paralyze you. And so please understand, you're not just going to wake up one day and fear be gone. You got to learn how to deal with it. High five somebody say, deal with it, deal with it, deal. All right, so here it is. There's three simple things to deal with it. Three simple things. Somebody say three simple things. I want to make it real simple. As easy as one, two, three. Number one, this is so simple. This is so simple. This is so simple. Oh, my God, this is so simple. This is probably the simplest message I have ever, ever taught, ever in the historicity of teaching messages. Number one, believe what God says about you. Now, notice I said believe. Now, here's the thing about belief. Here's the thing about belief. And I said this last week. Belief is so powerful that it will often disregard facts or truth. Okay. You can, you can say to somebody, hey, listen, this person isn't good for you. Well, how do you know that? Because I got a message from them saying they're no good for you. And they signed an affidavit stating that they're no good for you. And here's a picture of them stepping out on you. And here's their fingerprint with them signing their name and social security number next to it saying they're no good for you. And then here's a tweet, a tweet that they sent me the other day saying they're not good for you. And then here's God on, uh, God sent you a vine message saying they're no good for you. And then because God knew you wouldn't listen to vine, he put it on Instagram and said they're no good for you. And you know what a person will say? You just don't know them like I do. Your belief is so powerful that you will disregard what's in your face. So follow, follow the logic, follow the logic, follow the logic, follow the logic. Parents, I'm, I'm, I'm just because I want to make sure we get the point. Parents. Um, your children could perhaps be in need of some enhanced disciplinary tactics. You like how I cleaned that up? Didn't I clean it good? Didn't I do it? And everybody else could know that, but sometimes you might not know it. 
Oh, it's quiet in here. I hate to be the bearer of truth, <laughs> but I got to tell it like a TIS. Now, sometimes your children can be in, in need of enhanced disciplinary tactics. And because you want to believe the best about your children, you can ignore what everybody else knows. Their principal can send a note. Their teachers, first period, second period, third period, fourth period, fifth period, sixth period, seventh. They don't even have a seventh period teacher. They can say it too. Eighth period, ninth period, how many periods it got? Uh, every teacher can say, you need some enhanced disciplinary tactics. The principal can say, you need some enhanced disciplinary tactics. The school counselor can say, you need some enhanced disciplinary tactics. The school activities director can say, you need some enhanced disciplinary tactics. The parking one person out in the parking lot that don't even know your child can say, your child needs some enhanced disciplinary tactics. The bus driver that drives your child home, beep, beep, they can say, your child needs some enhanced disciplinary tactics. And you'll sit up and say, ain't nothing wrong with my child. It's every teacher here. <laughs> we got a lot of educators at Harvard, so y'all ought to be shouting right there. It's every teacher. It's every dean. It's every principal. It's not my kid. It's the, it's, y'all, it's a conspiracy. See, I knew from the day I brought my child to this school, y'all didn't like him. It's quiet here. And you will maintain your position that somehow 200 different people came together to have a meeting to conspire against you and your child. Because out of all the things they could be using their time to do, they decided they needed to have a meeting to conspire against you. You have another condition besides the telephobia. You have another one called paranoia. <laughs> It's real quiet in here. Now, I know that's not you, but you know somebody. You know somebody. Right? Mr. what are you trying to say? Belief is so powerful, you will disregard what's in front of you. So now, check this out. I, I want you to show you how to reverse it. How, how to reverse it. Uh, touch your neighbor and say, reverse it. You got, you got to reverse it. See, you got to coordinate. You got to reverse it. Okay, watch this. Philippians 4.13. I thought this was a Christian church. Philippians 4.13. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Because my point to you was believe what God says about you. And I used the word believe. What was the word I used? Believe. Now we understand because we just learned that belief is so powerful it will disregard what's in front of you. Okay, I want to show you something. Philippians 4.13. Say it with me. One, two, ready, read. Okay, say I believe that. Say it again. Put the verse up so they can say it. One, two, ready, read. How many of you have ever had a situation where that didn't seem true? Okay, check this out. But believe it, though. Come on, I did all of that to set it up. Believe it. So even though the facts tell me that doesn't look right, and even though my circumstance says that's not true, I choose to disregard facts and truth so that I can believe God's truth about me. So even though I may have failed and it looked like I couldn't do all things, I choose to live in denial and say that I can. Y'all miss what I just said. I got a Holy Ghost denial that I'm in that tells me that even when I get knocked down, that I can still do all things. Even when it doesn't look like it's working for my good, I choose to believe that I can do how many of them? And even when I fall flat on my back, I still can do. And even if I'm eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and chicken soup, I can do. And even if your money is so funny and your change is so strange, you can still do. I choose to believe that. So I disregard what you got to say, what your mom and them got to say, what my past got to say. I choose to disregard it because I choose to believe I can do. I choose to believe that. So it doesn't matter if last year taught you that, well, some stuff just don't work out. I, I don't care. I choose to do and to believe that I can do 
I choose to believe that. I choose to believe. Can, can I give you one more, one more thing to paint the picture? Y'all, y'all say, I, I can't give you one more. Let me, let me give you one. You ever? Um, I want to be careful here. You ever maybe seen someone who was convinced? Okay, I gotta be real careful. Touch the name and say, Bishop's being real careful. Have you ever seen someone that was convinced that they could wear <laughs> bookstore? Be quiet. <laughs> Singers, be <laughs> touch the name and say, love God, love people, love life. <laughs> that they could wear certain things and they believed they were flattering. Shh, come on, this is Christian church. Come on, y'all were just being quiet a minute ago, so I know you know how to be quiet, so just shh, 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 hush. The Lord's calling your name. And they believed it was flattering, but the general consensus differed with their opinion. I cleaned that up really nice. Here's the point, because I just needed you to see it, because the moment I said that, you, oop, you're like, well, that's a good point. He's, uh, I just want you to see it, because you remember what you see. Most of us are visual, so we remember what we see. I said we remember what we see. So, so check this out. <clears throat> but they believe that it is flattering. And they believe it, it looks great. And in fact, if you try to tell them contrary to that, you, you, you're going to fight on your hands. They love God, love people, love life, but don't talk about that. See the point? Is that, watch this, watch this. Opinions don't have to dictate my belief. Those three things that cause the telephobia, Somebody said you weren't good enough. An experience said you weren't good enough. Or you said you weren't good enough. See, those things, no, I, I just choose to believe that I can do all things. Watch this. I choose to believe in that analogy I just gave. I can wear all things. <laughs> Come on, stay with me. I choose to believe I can do all things. I choose to believe that. So because I choose to believe that, I disregard fact. Do you get that? Because we do it with a lot of other stuff, just not the good stuff. You follow what I'm saying? You got it. How do we conquer our telephobia? Number one, believe what God said about you. So, so watch this. Let, let me give you something real pragmatic you can do. I told you it's going to be a real simple message. Say pragmatic. Okay, that means something practically you can do. Because this is real nice spiritual talk, right? But let me give you something you can do. Create an atmosphere. That reminds you of who you are in Christ, not who you were. Create an atmosphere that reminds you of who you are in Christ, not who you were. Check this out. If, if, you, if you used to have a clubbing demon. It got real quiet right there. This must be the club. Where the club for? They were like. <laughs> and just for the sake of clarity, I'm being facetious. There's no such thing as a clubbing demon. That's just you, okay? So, so watch this. You can't have a bunch of pictures up on your wall or you dropping hot stuff. It got real quiet right there. They don't know nothing about that. Listen, listen. If, you just, if, you, if, the, if, if the Lord brought you out of prison or brought you out of jail, why are all your pictures... You oh, y'all ain't gonna say nothing to me. You're reminding yourself of who you were, but you're not telling yourself who you are. <laughs> Time about sweet memories. You better learn how to hit delete. Should I go further? Good morning, y'all. Good afternoon. 
Good evening. Uh, should I go further? See, 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 listen. We, we have a bad habit as humans of reminding ourselves of who we were, but not telling ourselves who we are in Christ. So everything in your closet reminds you of what you used to be. Say amen, because I, I feel a Kool-Aid stirring spirit, and I just say amen, and I won't stir. What's the flavor? That's so amazing. Red is not a flavor. It's a color. Okay. So check this out. What are the pictures in your phone? They're real quiet. On your wall, on your computer. What do those pictures remind you of? What do they tell you? Because they're sending a message. They're sending a message. I was, I was, um, I was helping somebody to, 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 in coaching them through some things and whatever. And I said, um, I said, give me, give me a, a picture, uh, give me a picture of you. Give me the picture that you think best represents you. And they brought up a picture from about uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And I said, here and lay the problem. You still live back there. So no wonder you're stuck in a time warp is because you're stuck in a time warp. To you, your last great day in life was 15 years ago. So no wonder you can't have any good days now because that picture is constantly reminding you that that was a good day. But the truth is it really wasn't all that good because if it was all that good, you'd still be in that with them people doing that stuff. It's quiet here. Okay, okay. Well, what, what does the art you have in your home, what does it speak to you? Say amen. amen. What does your cell phone background say to you? It's quiet. Check your neighbor's phone. Just look at your neighbor. Do it right now. Just check your phone. No, I'm, I'm just playing. Don't, I'm just playing. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. They might have to hit some buttons real fast. Just, just, just. If they're flipping through stuff, just, just look away. Don't make them feel bad. Come on, in. Ed Harvest. They, they ain't going to be judged. Just, just. Look at me. <laughs> well, what does that background say? What does it communicate to you? Oh. <laughs> I get it this evening. I get it this evening. Okay. What does your computer desktop background communicate to you? You still have the default thing back there? Default banner back there? Well, then no wonder why everything you do is on default. You missed it. Everything is a subconscious action. See, it, see all around me, in my office, it looks like the jungle. No, it really does, because I got lions and no tigers. No, 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 no. I want the king. Not no prince. I want the king. So, 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 so I got lions. I got eagles. And then I got a little Batman figurine. Because, no, because he, he, he does some protective work for me. And so, <laughs> no, because I, I like superheroes and I like, I, like the con I, like, I like the mental state that creates. See, when you're engaged in ministry, you are in the process of helping, uh, of God using you to help change the lives of other people. You follow what I'm saying? And, and so you're rescuing people from jokers and penguins and stuff. You follow it? So. And on a side note, Batman is a realistic, um, you know, probability for a superhero. That could happen. No, I'm just being serious now. Some of y'all look at me kind of funny. Like, how did he got real unspiritual? No, you need to get real spiritual. Batman could really have No, Superman couldn't really have him. Green Lantern, that ain't happening. Ain't nobody, ain't no green men coming down. No, that ain't happening. You know what I'm saying? That ain't happening. Spider-Man, that ain't happening. Get bit by a spider, you're going to get a bump. That's what's going to happen to you. <laughs> okay, anyway, so back to the message. Back to the message. I created an environment around me that reminds me of who I am in Christ. You follow what I'm saying? On my desktop screen, this is just me. I'm just, using, just telling you about me. You've got to do what works for you. On my desktop screensaver, it's a picture of Mufasa, the original. So he just looked like he finna shake something, do something, move something. He just looks like, just do something. 
Yes. In my home, in my home. See, I carry it through because everywhere I'm at, I need to be reminded of who I am in Christ. So I have signs up. I like excellence is important to me. So I have signs up in my home that say excellence. It's a, it's a lifestyle, not an event. So every time I go turn my heater up and down, I have to be reminded that excellence is important. Put the line up. That's not the one I use, but so you can get the point. Put it up. They got it. Show it to them. Show them the line. Don't you just feel like you can do something? I just... Look at one of your enemies and say something. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, 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 so check this out. Check this out. Very practically, to help you believe what God says about you, I encourage you to create an environment that reminds you of who you now are, not who you were. That means you got to go through and throw some old stuff out. I mean, some folks you some folks you got in your phone you haven't talked to in a year. Guess what that means? You ain't talked to them in a year. Guess what that means? You ain't talked to them in a year. So guess what that means? If we ain't talked in a year, we probably ain't finna talk next week. And he said, Bishop, well, no, I'm just gonna leave them. See, but every time you see that name, you're reminded of what you used to do and who you used to be not who you currently are. I, I wish I had a church that knew what I was talking about. Some of you were in a good mood until you accidentally scrolled through your contacts and saw a name, and then all of a sudden, it ruined your whole day. Okay. All right, I can see there's no help here. Number two. So what's the first thing? Pressing through a telephobia? Believe what God says about you, okay? And we got a good understanding of belief, right? So even when you fail, you still tell yourself, well, I, I don't care. I believe <laughs> I can do all things. Even when you make a mistake, I'm going to get right back up. You know how I keep getting back up? It's because I can do all things. Check it out. It didn't say the time frame in which those things can be done. So it means if I didn't do it last time, I'll get it this time. Because I know at the end I can do all things. So maybe I didn't do them in, in, in 13, but that's all right. This is 14. That was then. This is now. I can still do all things. And whatever I don't knock out in 14, that's cool. Another year's coming. I'm... Number two, press through it. Press through it. I told y'all this is going to be the simplest message. Press through it. Go to Philippians. Uh, we're right there. Just flip back one page if you have a traditional Bible. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 13. It says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. In other words, Paul says, I haven't arrived, and I know that. Dangerous people are people who think they've arrived. You've met Christians like that who think they've arrived because they stopped cussing and stopped drinking. They forgot about the fact that they're gossips and liars and all the other stuff, but they want to judge the other people that do the other stuff that God brought them out of. And rather than giving them mercy and love like they needed mercy and love, they figure I'll give them judgment and condemnation. Okay, it's real quiet in here. Look what it says. Paul says, I know I haven't arrived. This is a man whose handkerchiefs healed people. He said, I'm not there yet. This is a man who, when he got annoyed, turned around and said, I curse you in the name of the Lord. And then all of a sudden, their life was through. <laughs> he says, I've not arrived. He says, but I know how to do one thing real good. Touch your neighbor and say, I got, I got one trick. Tell me I got one trick. I know one thing how to do. I know how to do this one thing really well. I know how to forget those things which are behind. And I know how to reach forward to those things which are ahead. In other words, the Apostle Paul was saying, I can't reach forward and backward at the same time. That's when I feel stretched. That's when I feel like I'm getting ready to break. I feel like I'm getting ready to break because I got two hands and two different realms. I can't have a realm in the future and a realm in my a hand in the realm of my yesterday. He says, I forget those things that are behind and I reach forward to those things which are ahead. Look at verse 14. He says, I press. Somebody shout, I'm pressing. I'm pressing. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, somebody say, therefore. Let us, as many as are mature, which means the way you're knowing you're becoming a mature Christian is that when you can say, I got to let that go so I can get this. I got to crucify good so great can live. I got to crucify fear so that greatness can live. I, I, I forget those things that are behind. And he says, therefore, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal this even to you. 
So what's today's message? It's God revealing it to you. But Paul, Paul said this. Paul said, Paul said, Paul said, he said, I realize I haven't arrived. Can we all be honest? We've not arrived. Now, you've made progress. Say, I've made progress. But there's more progress to make. Life is not where, whoo, I beat that one and I'm done. No. Time to beat another one. And another one. And another one. And another one. And another one. Check this out. A telephobia is really an opportunity to defeat your feelings of inadequacy and insecurity. You missed it. When the fear of not feeling good enough shows up, that's the only time I'm looking at it face to face to kill it. You missed what I just said. You can't conquer what you won't fight. But you can't fight what's not in front of you. You didn't hear what I just said. So when fear shows up, that's my opportunity now to knock the heaven out of it. First Sunday. I'll be back next week. What's this? See it as an opportunity to advance and not retreat. What most of us by default do is when fear shows up, when the fear of not feeling good enough shows up, we play into it. Oh, that's right. Woe is me. Oh, I just always mess up. Seems like I take one step forward, I get knocked back too. God, why me? Lord, this ain't right. That's what most of us do. Can we be honest? We play into it. That's our default setting. But the reality is, is when it shows up, that's the only opportunity we get to kill it. So when a telephobia shows up, because guess what? It's going to show up maybe today, maybe tomorrow. It maybe may show up once you walk out into the vestibule. Whenever it shows up, you say, wait a minute, now that I got you in plain sight. I didn't know that you were the thing that was robbing me yesterday. But now that I got you in plain sight, you could have got me yesterday, but today I've heard a word, and that word now is going to set me free from you. And since I got you in plain sight, I can do all things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stop telling me why I messed up. Stop telling me what I can't do. Let me tell you what I can do. Because it's going to talk. It's going to talk. It's going to talk. This message is so apropos because there's some things the Lord set before me to do and to, and to accomplish and different things. And, 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 and I would feel that thing jumping up. But what about this? Then I was like, I don't know. What about that? See, that's why some of you are moody. Okay, it's quiet. And then, ladies, don't let it be some extra things to help contribute to it. Oh, say it, man. Don't look at me with that tone of voice. Y'all ain't saying nothing. That's why some people are so moody. That's why they're up and down. They're up and down because they keep dealing with the telephobia. And rather than choking it, they let it choke them. So when you start thinking tomorrow, oh, nothing ever works, you better choke that trick. You better choke. I wish I had a church of folk that used to be a little thuggy. Where y'all at? Where y'all at? Yeah, you better learn how. Oh, you set up? No, no, you ain't getting me this time. You robbed me in 2012. You robbed me in 2013. How about somebody say, choke that trick? Now, for all the Denver people who are very alarmed because you don't know what a trick is and you want to know why we're choking it. Tricks are for kids, so we're choking childish stuff. Didn't I clean it up? Didn't I clean it up? Now come to the after worship experience. Come to the after party. I'll tell you what I really meant, but just. See, because here's the deal. We're having all these internal conversations, especially when we make mistakes and when we mess up. When we mess up, we get all these internal conversations, right? And, and, and I'm almost through, but, but, but check this out, check this out. One of the things that often shows up when we make mistakes and when we don't do things quite right is condemnation. Think of a, you ever seen a condemned building? <clears throat> I remember I was, uh, I was in a city recently and I was uh, just checking out some stuff and visiting different places and doing that kind of thing. 
and uh, we got to a destination. And when I got to the destination, um, I looked at the building and I said, they didn't sent me to a condemned building. Literally, it, it was an old facility that, that they had built a new one. Watch this. The new one was right next door to it. Watch this. But all I could see was the condemned one. There was a brand new state of the art one right next door. But from my vantage point and my perspective, I could only see the one that was messed up. So I turned and looked and said, what in the world? Who sent me? Who put this schedule together? Who sent me here? Watch this. And, and, and then I looked down and said, oh, it's a new one. Y'all are missing what I'm saying. When old stuff and old habits and old patterns and old ways try to show up, you got to remind yourself, wait a minute, there's a new one. And if any man be in Christ, behold, all things have passed away and all things have become new. Which means I got to look past the condemned one and I got to see the new one. Because check this out, God never condemns. He never condemns. He never condemns. He convicts. Condemnation says, oh, how low you are. How bad you are. Conviction says, oh, how much greater than that you are. See the difference? See, God's not telling you how low you are. God's telling you how much greater than that you are. Did you get that? Did you get that? Here's the third one. And then this is the one where we shout. Y'all got it? What's the first thing to defeating a telephobia? Second thing. Press through it. Okay, press through it. Press through it. Which means, check it out. When you're pressing through it, sometimes it's going to be tough. Sometimes you're going to have to sit in your car for a couple minutes. Anybody know about them car meetings where you have them with yourself? Anybody know? Sometimes you've got to have a meeting in the car with yourself. In the bathroom. Sometimes you got to do it while in a meeting, sitting at the table. You got to just have a meeting. Now, your bishop go to sleep? No, he's having a meeting. He's having a meeting, and he'll, he'll be right back in just a minute. Here's the third thing. You ready? If you fail, oh well. I'm going I'm to show you. If you fail, oh well. Now, now watch this. Proverbs 24, 16. Proverbs 24, 16. You got it? How many people said that? Well, I'm not flipping because I know they're going to put it on the screen. Okay, all right, fine. All right, here we go. <laughs> Proverbs 24, 16. For a righteous man. Now, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. If, you, if you're not yet a Christian, this is going to apply to you in a moment. But for those that are, this applies to you right now. Proverbs 24, 16. For a righteous man. Now, now look at me. Maybe you came from a church that told you you were always earning something with God. Okay, you're earning righteousness. Uh, you got to live right. <laughs> and notice the people that promulgated that. Okay, shut up, shut up, shut up, Foreman. Yes, sir. Okay, for a righteous man, here's what the Bible says about righteousness. That it's been given to us as a free gift. Here's what Jesus did on Calvary. On Calvary, we were sitting in a seat of condemnation and unrighteousness. Righteousness means right standing with God. Okay? If you got a right standing credit report, you can get what you want. You get the point? If you got a right standing history of paying your power bill, guess what works when you flip the light on? Your lights. Okay? You get it? So if I'm righteous, if I'm in right standing with God, that means I've got access to God. And that means when I pray, he hears me. Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. You get what righteousness is. So here's what Jesus did. We were sitting before Jesus. We were sitting in a seat called unrighteousness, sin, shame, and condemnation. That's where we sat. Here's what the scripture says Jesus did. Jesus vicariously interrupted and gave us his righteousness. Let me say, Bishop, what does vicarious mean? Jesus said, get up out your seat. Would you just do it for a minute? I know you're writing down and taking notes, but you just stand up for a minute. Here's what Jesus said. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, you're sitting right here in a seat of unrighteousness. Got it? Here's what Jesus says. I'm going to take your seat and you take my seat. You missed it. We were sitting in unrighteousness, sin, and shame. Jesus was sitting in righteousness, peace, prosperity, everything that you need from God. Jesus said, when I died on Calvary, I was not just dying and shedding my blood. I did a seat change. Would you swap seats with your neighbor real quick so they get it? 
Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, now swap back so that nobody purses and stuff get missing and all that. Okay. Okay. Sit down. Here's what Jesus did. He says, "I take your seat forever, and you get to take my seat forever." You're not hearing what I'm saying. Which means even when I mess up, I'm still the righteousness of God. Even when I fall, I'm still the righteousness of God. So Proverbs 24, 16, it says, for a righteous man. So now who's that talking about? Say your name. That's who it's talking about. Not somebody that does everything right. Not somebody that's perfect. Not somebody that's never thought crazy thoughts. Not somebody that's never done crazy things. No. Nope. When I said, Jesus, I do, Jesus said, I did. <laughs> In other words, he says, I took your seat and you took my seat. So look what happens for a righteous man. So let's make it personal. Say your name. See, it's a gift, so you can't earn it. It's a gift. You can't earn it. It's a gift. You can't earn it. Well, then somebody might say, well, then, Bishop, why should I live right? Well, now, wait a minute. No, no, let's connect. Let's get, it, let's get it correct. Because we are righteous, we can live righteously. See, I'm not living righteously to become righteous. Because I'm righteous, I can live righteously. Y'all miss what I just said. Oftentimes, we do things to become, not because we are. Because I am a son of God, I can act like a son of God. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying. Because I am am holy I can live holy I'm not doing it to become because I am I do I'm not trying to earn it I got it so all I got to do is walk it out and if I'm on the south side I just walk it out okay all right all right I said okay here it is Proverbs 24 16 I gotta move because I went way longer than I thought here we go for a righteous man say your name so for you may fall and watch this not once not twice come on any counters of the room not three times not four times not five times not six times but seven of them you know what seven is the biblical number for completion so even though i'm a complete failure <laughs> anybody ever felt like that before I wish I had a church that wasn't the same to admit it, even though I feel like a complete. And even if everybody says that's what you are, and even if that's what your mama says, and even if that's what your bloodline says, what does the book say? Even when you feel like a complete failure. What are you getting ready to do? God, I wish I had a church here. What are you getting ready to do? So in the moments you feel like a total failure, that's when God says, watch me have a resurrection you ain't got to wait for Easter Sunday to talk about resurrection. If you feel like a failure right now, you ought to be on your feet shouting because God made you a promise. The promise is you're about to. I wish you'd shout rise again. What are you doing? Okay. Okay, sir. I got to finish the point. So you got to read the Bible in and out. He was saying, he was saying Proverbs wisdom. He was saying, I want to talk to the people that feel like total failures. Seven, complete failure. He said, even if you fall, he said, I got a promise for you. You're going to rise again. So how do I get rid of a fear of not feeling good enough? If I fail, oh well. Now listen to me, listen to me, listen real carefully. It's not having a passive attitude about failure. It's not having a nonchalant attitude about failure. It's saying what Bishop Thomas Edison said. I made him a bishop. It's what Bishop Thomas Edison said. Listen to what he said. He said, I have not failed. I just found 10,000 ways that won't work. What if you started looking back on your life and say, you know what? 
No, that, that wasn't failure. I just figured out that won't work, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work, that won't, that won't. But even with everything that wouldn't work, I wrote the book and I read it over in Romans chapter 8. That he'll make all things work together for the good of them that. I wish you'd have five somebody say, it's working for you, it's working for you. So, Thomas Edison said, I said, I didn't fail. He said, I just found 10,000 ways that, that won't work. Which means even when you feel like a complete failure, even when you feel like a total failure, and really you're not, but that's what you're telling yourself. Because you got a lot of victories, right? You got a lot of good stuff you've done, right? You, you've conquered some stuff that other people are in a crazy house for, right? You've conquered some issues that other folk are laying down complaining about, didn't you? But watch this. It just means if I fail, I'm going to get back up again, and I'm going to try again. Sir James Dyson, you know the last name because you've seen those vacuums. Anybody ever seen the Dyson vacuum? Now, please understand, these comments are not intended to be any kind of recommendation for any kind for any business. <laughs> please make your own decisions concerning the vacuum cleaners that you use. Terms and conditions may apply. Okay, so watch this. I like watching biographies. I tell you all this all the time. Because I figure by the time I'm tired of saying it, that's when you finally get it. So I'm going to keep saying it. So I like watching biographies. And, and I was watching one about Sir James Dyson. And Sir James Dyson, uh, you know, had uh, these different businesses and different things that he had started. And he had had one vacuum that was real successful. I think it was in the 80s. And, uh, but, you know, his company, he, he, uh, he got voted out of his own company. There's another man that did that too. Who, and uh, he came back and changed the world. But they voted him out of his own company, so he's voted out of his own company. And uh, so he wanted to develop a, a better vacuum cleaner because he said the vacuum cleaner is just not good. He said, you know, they, these bags, they get clogged. And from the moment you start using the vacuum cleaner, it doesn't work as good anymore. And I've always had that same issue too. And then, you know, you think you buy the real nice one. You buy the one that costs an extra $20. And so you think that extra $20 that you spend is going to really make a difference to only discover that I should have got the $15 one because it's just. <laughs> Check this out. On, 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 on the vacuum model that he made, I think, it was the, I think it was the one with the ball, I think. Don't quote me on it. I think it was the one with the ball to where you can move it around. And, 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 and I bought it, too. I bought it. But then I found another one that I like better. But I bought that one, too, though. And so, and so, and so do you know? He took, it took him 5,127, I believe was the number, of prototypes he had to make wow. before he got one that worked. Wow. You missed it. Not two, not 200, not 2,000. Can you imagine making 5,000 vacuums and don't none of them work? And I'm sure he felt like he wasn't good enough, three billion dollars less. Uh-huh, you missed it. But he kept on going, and he kept on going, and he kept on going, and he kept on going. That one didn't work, that one didn't work, that one didn't work. I'll try another one, that one didn't work, I'll try another one, that one didn't work, I'll try another one, that one didn't work, I'll try another one. He kept going until we're now three and a half billion dollars later. He's like, I'm so glad I didn't quit. You're not hearing what I'm saying. It may not be on the second time, may not be on the third, may not be on the 5,000, but it may be 5,127. And you better learn that when you feel like throwing in the towel, I said this last week, you better learn that when you feel like throwing in the towel, you better learn how to snatch it back. Because just when you're getting ready to throw in the towel, that might be the breakthrough moment. They asked him, they said, you never felt like giving up? He said, oh, of course I did. And then you think at some point he just settled. Well, that one's good enough. But he said it's not good enough for me. See, it's some stuff because some people look at you and say, you ought to just be happy. You ought to just be happy. And you're like, that may be good enough for you. But that's not good enough for me. And I don't live in competition with you. I live in competition with yesterday's version of myself. Can I give one more example? <clears throat> uh, 
Lakewood, uh, Lakewood Church, Pastor uh, Joel Osteen, and uh, uh, he, uh, his father, for the, of course, he inherited a, uh, a mega church. Uh, I think it was about six, 7,000 people in the church when he took it over or something like that. And Houston, Bible Belt, city where people love Jesus. God-loving country, you know? And uh, it got real quiet right there. <laughs> Just a different, different, different ball game, right? And, um, you know, you can put a sign out tomorrow and say, Jesus Christ, Deliverance Tabernacle, and you're going to have at least 150 people show up. You're going to be like, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know who that is, but just damn church. And, and, and check this out. Now, they've got something. Um, Pastor Joel Osteen's auditorium seats about 16,000 people. And so, um, coincidentally, because I'm going to tie this in, when he came, when he came to Denver, uh, he had about 11,000 people. So that means he came to this region and had less in a big event than he had in one service at his church. I'm going to connect the dots in a minute. I'm just trying to move on. But for the first 10 years of Lakewood Church there in Houston, Joel's daddy, Pastor Joel's daddy, had less than 120 people come to church. For the first 10 years. You missed it. Imagine had his daddy given up year nine. Imagine had his daddy gave up the, the day before 10 years. We often underestimate what we can do in the long term and overestimate what we can do in the short term. And so now when Joel looks out and he's got 45,000 people coming to church, a lot of people, it takes long to get to church than the whole service. You can't, you can't be late. You get to church, but they're done now. He's done. <laughs> 16,000 people. And, and they were asking Pastor Joel, they said to him, they said, well, what happens if, uh, you know, were you scared? Were you nervous? He said, of course I was. He said, I was a camera worker. I didn't, I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know how to preach. I, didn't, I don't know those kind of things. I just know how to work cameras. And uh, he said, but this is what I told myself. Listen to what he said. He said, I told myself. If I fail, I'll do something else. It's so freeing when you realize what Proverbs 24, 16 says. And even if I feel like a total failure, I'll just get up again. Y'all missing it. It's so simple. You're missing it. And even if I feel like it's not going to work, I'll just get up again. I'll just... Get up again. I'll just get up again. So if I fail, oh well. It's not the end. It's not the end. This won't be the end of my book. This won't be the end of my story. Some of you got so much stress and pressure because you're trying so hard not to fail that you end up failing because you're trying so hard not to. If I fail, Oh, well, I'm not being nonchalant. I'm not being passive. I'm just saying I'll get back up again. Because the book made me a promise. That if a righteous man, say your name. If I fall seven times, I will rise again. Everybody stand on your feet with me. Telephobia, a fear of not being good enough. Notice what it is, y'all. It's a fear of not being good enough. <laughs> you missed it. It's not even necessarily true. It's a fear that it might be true. It's amazing what we're scared of, what might be. What might be true. I might not be good enough. 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 Can I tell you a story? Okay, well, for the four people, I'll tell you after church, because the rest of these people don't want to hear it. Can I tell you a story? It's only 30 seconds. It ain't like you got nothing to do in this nine-degree weather. <laughs> so I go home and eat. Because you went to the bistro 
and got your meal. Oh, my God. I know they put their foot in it. No, literally, I said, take your sock off and put your foot on that foot. I said, oh, my God, I know it's going to be so good. You got to stop by the bistro. And do not take mine. First fruit goes a man of God. First fruit. Read your Bibles. <laughs> Ezekiel 34. Read your Bible. 44. <coughs> I, um, I'm a results-oriented guy. I like getting stuff done. Anybody else like that? While other people are talking, I've just finished it. <laughs> While you're having a meeting about what could be done, I just did it. <clears throat> I've been that way my whole life. And uh, eight years ago, uh, almost eight years ago, come May, um, when God gave me the directive to plant a church, I just knew in that first year I was going to be looking at a thousand people. I just knew it. It was on the prayer list. It was on I just knew it. Now, I started with a team, half of them were devils. Well, probably about 90% of them were devils. And Judas's. I never met more Judas's until I came to Denver. And, um, and, and, and I just knew. I said, Lord, because you, know, you told me to do it. So I said, if you told me to do it, I know that's what I want. And so we got a deal going, right? Right? And so, needless to say, at the end of 2006, 1,000 people. Okay. Now, for those of you watching online, you don't know how many folk in here. <laughs> Uh, but it ain't quite a thousand people. Now you include both, you know, we closed the online and all that. But here's the point though. Here's the point. I, um, I remember at the end of that year saying, okay, all right, God, I'm gonna do it this year. I'm gonna do it this year. I'm gonna do it this year. Here's the long and short of it. I can remember feeling real, real, not depressed, but real, real frustrated and real angry. I said, because God, I said, I'm not being arrogant or pretentious. I said, but I know the quality of the gift because you're the giver of the gift. And I know what they preach it in this city, and I know they ain't preaching what I'm preaching nowhere else. And I ain't even started preaching. I'm just trying to lay foundation. So this is just Bishop's motivation.